Hello, everyone. Welcome to Aloud. I'm Jessica Strand, the Director of Public Programming here. Um, it's wonderful to see you all here on this evening. So um, for those who are not uh, familiar with the Library Foundation, we raise, uh, we raise critical funds for the Los Angeles Public Library programs, which include Read Baby Read, Adult Literacy, and even Tech to Go, which gives anyone with a library card the ability to take out a Chromebook and a hotspot. These programs and others are available to support and help all Angelinos across this vast city. So tonight, we've got Sloan Crosley, who will be discussing her new novel, Cult Classic, which focuses on the adventures of Lola, a 38-year-old woman who, f who fears of spending the rest of her life with her fiance, result in a series of more than coincidental encounters with ex-boyfriends all within a five-block radius in downtown New York City. This book, this, this look at love and modern romance leaves all the cliches aside and is full of satire, cynicism, and a realistic take on contemporary relationships. As one of the characters says about romance, quote, it may be the world's oldest cult, end of quote. Let me introduce tonight's guest. Sloan Crosley is the author of the novel The Clasp and three essay collections, Look Alive Out There, and the New York Times bestseller, I Was Told There'd Be Cake and How Did You Get This Number, a two-time finalist for the Thurber Prize for American Humor and a contributing editor to Vanity Fair. Cult Classic is her second novel. Judy Greer is an actress who has appeared in nearly 200 roles to date, including the Bloomhouse reboot of Halloween, Richard Linkletter's Where'd You Go, Bernadette, and Alexander Payne's Academy Award winning The Descendants. Her television roles have included the FX comedy series Married, Netflix's Arrested Development, and Hulu's Casual. In 2018, Judy made her directorial debut with a happening of monumental proportions. Currently, she stars in Hulu's upcoming series Reboot, which will be on in September. So please welcome Sloan Crosley and Judy Greer. Thank you. For the folks at home. <laughs> oh, yeah, hey. we might need them for the live streamers, yeah, the our live streamers. Our streamers. Welcome. Thank you all for coming. Um, I'm going to read for a tiny, yeah, yeah. a tiny hot minute um, just because this book just came out and uh, you might not all have read it um, and you won't be prepared for the quiz that we're going to give you at the end. Um, so, this is just a little bit. And as um, it was introduced. This is uh, the beginning of the book. Lola, who's our, our heroine, leaves and runs into her uh, first ex-boyfriend, uh, which is seems like a totally normal coincidence. She doesn't know that there's something more nefarious going on. So I'm just going to give you a little bit of a flavor of that experience for like five minutes. It was then that I spotted my ex-boyfriend, Amos. Amos was standing outside the restaurant with a taller friend. The two of them shared a, sh a square of sidewalk, the friend running his thumb under the strap of a messenger bag to relieve the weight. I could tell they'd just come from inside. Larger forces had protected us from seeing each other, but larger forces had done all they could. When I left and came back, they'd wash their hands of me. This was not a place I would have expected Amos to have heard of, forget patronize. When we were together, he was dismissive of the fetishized expense of Manhattan. Manhattan was a soulless place, gentrified, once for the very young and the very rich, now only for the very rich and the very soulless. Reduced to a high-end strip mall, all the city's personality was in the past, all its pride delusional. I was too tired to mount a defense, tired, probably, from having to schlep to bed to see my boyfriend. Dropping our near identical rents in the and, or the Pilates studios of his neighborhood into conversational evidence bags didn't seem worth it. 
Besides, what Amos never understood was that with each pronouncement of my home as a dead zone, he made me feel better about living here. The eye of the hurricane may be inaccessible, but it's still the eye. Toward the end of our relationship, I felt a reactionary love for all the things Amos hated. Not just Manhattan, but streaming surface, surfaces, nature videos, expensive toiletries, pop music, smartphones, beaches, throw pillows, bottled water, alternative milks, kitchen gadgets, a strawberry distemmer, who knew, and cats. So completely did I commit to these things. Was this the first time anyone adopted a kitten out of spite? I convinced myself they were more indicative of who I was than the deeper things Amos and I had in common. I became resentful of the books and politics and niche references that had brought us together, as if they had betrayed me by leading me into the arms of a man who diagnosed Clive as a charlatan and my friends as morally impoverished. Our relationship never would have lasted for the two years it did were it not for Kit. Amos had a 20-something cousin named Kit, a Hollywood starlet with a thing for filters and quotations but she was a blood relation which made her tolerable to Amos, which in turn made him tolerable to me. When Kit was filming in New York, the three of us went out to dinner. She ordered food as if she and the waiter were working on a project together. She recounted stories from Amos's childhood and demanded our conversion from tequila to mezcal. You're so good at this, Amos told her. Too bad you're Jewish. Kit flicked a straw wrapper that she'd been bawling into Amos's face, and he cackled. She unlocked a less capacious Amos. He refrained from deriding the Hollywood industrial complex in front of her. When the bill came, Kit grabbed it like it was nothing. I'd never seen someone take a check like that without momentarily losing track of what they were saying. But Amos didn't flinch, whereas whenever I grabbed the bill, we had weird sex afterward. It's just like a tiny bit. <laughs> Thanks. Hi. <laughs> just like a little bit. I had underlined in my copy so many of the things that you wrote that were my, I mean, like I kept thinking like, oh, I'll just say a few of my favorite oh. quotes. But you read one of them, which was that she ordered like her, she and the waiter were doing a project. Yeah, yeah I mean, <laughs> yes. And you made us actresses in Los Angeles. No. Just, no, it's okay. No, it's not it's you. Really fine. It's no, not it's really you, fine. it's me. <laughs> <laughs> um, anyway, I'm so excited to be on this side of the Q&A for oh, once great. in my life. And um, I'm excited because I love this book. I loved it so much. And, and so I never get to talk to authors um, for very long anyway. And I have what a million... What happens not for very long? They because don't. I'm at parties <laughs> and then I forget things and they run away or right. someone comes with a drink or okay. yeah. um, I didn't read their book so I get nervous and right. pretend I have to go to the bathroom. Do you want to ask me about <laughs> the alien abduction that ends this book? <laughs> no, <I'm> kidding. Shit. <laughs> kidding. <laughs> um, <laughs> you said no spoilers. Sorry. Um, <laughs> so anyway, this is really exciting for me and um, you're all here, so you probably know a lot about her already, your fans. Um, this is your second novel. It is, yeah. And I'm wondering what uh, it was like to write your second novel. like, mm. And then writing it, I'm assuming, during the pandemic, because we're still in it. Um, how what was the difference i guess in in because you write so many essays and you're a journalist and so like how is it how's the process different first of all and then how is it different writing your second novel um Oh my gosh, I feel like uh, instantly I feel like a politician. I'm so happy you asked that I'm question. I'm so happy that <laughs> just, I wrote it down. Like I'm filibustering until I can figure out the answer. I can keep uh, talking. I'm really good at vamping. Yeah. <laughs> um, so the second one... Um, is not it's not like a, a pregnancy thing where your body's more used to it. I think it's not it's not like it's not easier than the first in some ways. But I do think that there's a way that um, with and it sort of dovetails with the, the sort of second half of your question, which is what's the sort of difference between writing, you know, fiction, nonfiction. Yeah. And I feel like um, the first one, the clasp, it's basically a comedy of manners, but it's a little bit younger. And um, 
I know I can do that. I mean, it's maybe an egotistical thing to say, but I know I can do that kind of like sitting around bantery thing. But I also want to give these people who are bored with their lives and um, or frustrated with their lives some sort of a mystical or magical wish fulfillment. Um, And in a weird way with the clasp, um, the characters go on this sort of mad cat hunt for a necklace. And with this, um, you know, Lola, our heroine, is uh, engaged to be married, and she decides to follow through with this opportunity that's presented to her where she can run into everyone she's ever dated if she steps within a five-block radius of um, a gutted synagogue on the Lower East Side that's been turned into a cult. I don't, it seems, weirdly, it starts to seem very normal. Um, I'm like, yeah, that's kind of totally well it's weird like a lot of people a lot of the reviews are will mention the sort of different elements of it like it's speculative fiction or magical realism and i'm like i think it might be marketing but um I, i'm not sure <laughs> <laughs> marketing <laughs> yeah i mean i think if i had like a lot a big budget i could put you and someone you don't want to see in the same room together for a lot less than it costs in the book <laughs> but um so but i didn't actually to, to answer your or part of your question i actually finished this uh, handed in the first draft, um, sent the email to my editor on March 9th, 2020. Holy buckets. Yeah. Wow. So, so I so, didn't, so there's like not New York So nostalgia. you had nothing to do during the pandemic. <laughs> <laughs> you like, how been, sad. And, <laughs> I was like, well, this is, really I had cool. nothing to do. I mean, I ended up, I edited it. Edited? It's weird for what that word means, how hard it is to say. Edited it? <laughs> you I edited, edited it. it. Did, did. During the pandemic. But I also like worked on like you know more right. nonfiction. But um, this was actually really nice to come back to because it's so New York heavy. Yes, and be like I miss my town. Yeah. You know? yeah, it is really fun to be a part of this five block radius that you talk yeah. about, <laughs> and not being a New Yorker, but having spent long chunks of time there. It was like I think I know that bench. I think I know where she's talking about. Probably. Um, we don't move our benches very much. No. They're nailed down. They're really stuck there you it's like a are... really cheap hotel room where everything is nailed down <laughs> <laughs> i wouldn't know um <laughs> oh, i'm just kidding <laughs> i just did that to be funny um <laughs> clearly worked it worked um, it worked well <laughs> so i when you were talking about you know you're talking about the characters in in the class and and the characters here and what i noticed in reading both of them is that you know these characters have grown up and what was fun about the characters in the class was these are college friends and we all have those but then in here you're talking so much about your work friends which become weirdly like your real life friends like and so this is a group of people that you have kept together Mm -hmm. through the death of the magazine modern psychology which is how they all meet and and the ringleader clive who who keeps them following him um, but that's interesting. Like, talk about what you feel about friendships as you grow older, and mm-hmm. and you know, like our college friends kind of turn into our siblings in a way where you're like, yeah, well, I'm never gonna lose them. <laughs> <laughs> Try as they might, <laughs> they're just around forever. But then yeah. you have this new this family. This is the person you sort of decide you want to try to be like when you get your first real job, mm-hmm. and these are relationships that you know, you, you get to kind of choose more in a way. And I, I'm so, I can I feel like a politician. I don't mean to, I'm so happy you asked that. <laughs> but the reason why is because I feel like the, there is this parade. And at some point I describe it as it being propelled from a t-shirt gun of ex-boyfriends throughout the book. But like, I hate to sound like it's about the friends we made along the way, but truly the container, um, is that is that friendship where they they all worked in a magazine, um, as Judy said, called Modern Psychology, which is like obviously psychology today. It's like the least creative part of the book. Um, <laughs> I was like, oh my god, did that magazine really and then exist? I realized, yeah, oh, but good yeah. for psychology today. In real life, has not folded in the book. Well, super uh, folds. Well, it's, I'm sure it will uh, soon. I mean, in style gone. <laughs> you're like, hello. You're like, is it media? <laughs> is it glossy? It's done. Um, but yeah, it's, um, but it's, because I think the characters in the class are still sort of growing up together. And I think that um, these guys didn't really grow up together. What happens is it's this sort of narrowing of experience. I mean, you can't, 
I mean, the show The Office is based on this phenomenon, you know, um, or then we came to the end, the Joshua Ferris. Like, I there's love a that lot, book. such a good book. But there's a lot of like the idea of an office comedy. And this doesn't take place in an office, but it's sort of deeper than that. There's a part where they were so close. And I like that she's 37 in this book. And so there is time for her to have this complicated relationship with Clive, her old boss, who used to be her mentor at some point. She thought maybe they would have a, um, would a romantic kiss. relationship. Exactly. And then, it, you know, she also sort of hates him and loves him. And like, he's an indelible part of her life too. And she has this moment at some point where she's like, how did these people wind up becoming my people? And what's weird is like, there's a smoother transition with college with, with work. I find it's like shocking as someone who used to work for random house for a decade or so, it's sort of shocking to share, you know, eight plus hours and just the air and all the topics with people. And then there's a bit in the book where there's a, one of these reunion dinners that they're at. And, um, Lola, the heroine asks her old coworker, Zach, like, you know, if he has any fun summer plans, and he looks at her and he's like, are you making conversation with me? <laughs> like, what? Like, you know, like, we used to be so close. Yeah, we didn't used to have and to so, do like, this. And so it's such a specific, messy relationship. But that's part of the reason why I like that she's older. Because if it was a younger person, you might think she was going to get together with Clive. Which I won't spoil the ending. But she doesn't get together with Clive. <sighs> I kind of want to... He's like basically turns into a cult leader. So... It kind of kills the romance. You know? Yeah. I mean, or but, if you're into that yeah. kind of thing. But the friendship is like, it's, it does, it's... Um, it's really sweet. Yeah, and I'm glad you I, noticed it. I totally get why they all sort of like stick to it. They all stay with him. They all still yeah. follow him. And it, it is like, they're just... It becomes a part of your DNA when you have someone, I think at that age, that like really impressionable age, mm -hmm. telling you what to do. You just... Like, I just kind of want that person to keep telling me what to do. And you have yeah. to start to learn that that person cannot tell you what to do anymore right. and you shouldn't listen to them anymore. And in this case, he takes advantage of it. Yes. Um, a, a lot. Mm -hmm. But um, yes. And then, um, but it's also interesting. I kind of wanted to, I, I know you have questions, but it was one of I'd the... I'd rather hear you talk. Well, no, but one of the things I was going to ask you... <laughs> 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 Yes. <laughs> um, it's interesting. So uh, you have Lola, you have this group of people that she uh, knows from way back when, but one of them that is really, um, that she's really tight with, that is also part of this sort of now cult that is using her and her love life as a, as a guinea pig, um, is a woman named Vadi. And you tend to play... Once in a while, I've played a sidekick, best friend, assistant. Exactly. Yes, it's true. <laughs> I know. <laughs> Put yourself there if you can. I'm <laughs> trying so hard. Um, yes, of yeah. course, she's my favorite character. She's, in the book. <laughs> but she's the part which says so much about me. I'm doing the right thing but with she's, my but life. But it's interesting because I feel like she's her own person. And I wonder if, like, you know, some of the sidekick characters that you've played, I wonder if you feel like they were there. I, I want to make, I wanted to make her a sidekick that could exist very much without Lola. That almost doesn't actually give that much of a shit about Lola. Yeah. I mean, I was good. So, so I love this character. I really do like her the best because also I kind of want to be her cause she's very cool. Yeah. Um, she's so cool. And you understand why Lola is drawn to her and why everyone's drawn to her. But one thing, and I might've missed it in the book is why does she do this to her friend? <laughs> yeah. I was about to say, I think my <laughs> pendulum like swung too far, like from, I didn't, I don't like the idea of, Again, I, I shouldn't say sidekick, but, you know, the best friend mm -hmm. living in service. I mean, everyone has that person where you're like, I don't know. I have a couple of really great friends where if I, like, go to lunch with them and I come away, I have to, like, remind myself to ask them questions because then I feel so guilty afterwards because they've just, I'm like, okay, no, we have to talk about you. Right. And I didn't want her to be like that. And so I wonder if in some ways my pendulum swung almost too far and I made her kind of like, I think her loyalty. So the reason why Vadi goes along, you know, it's a sort of conspiracy to, to get mm -hmm. Lola to run into these ex-boyfriends and possibly uh, have her therefore find closure. Um, 
finally and be able to move on with her life uh, without ruining her relationship, which it may or may not do. Mm-hmm. Um, but I feel like Vadi, I actually kind of don't blame her for sort of being in cahoots with Clive and, and sort of running what is essentially like the game. On, yeah, it is kind of the game. Well, because it's that. so part of... She worships him too. It's almost right. like I imagine all the characters are sitting at a bar and they're friends, but they're all facing the same direction, and that direction is Clive. Mm-hmm. So, like, as much as Vadi is friends with Lola, she is like a higher god. Except for I would, I would say when you sell this for millions to turn into a movie or yeah. limited series, which is very popular right now, <laughs> and I feel lends itself more to novels because you can do everything in the book instead of just picking and choosing. But I would say for this character... this is very helpful. (laughs) Sure. (laughs) You can email me with your offers. Um, uh, (laughs) That... So I think what I would do in this is I would want to do this to my friend because I would be so sick of her indecisive right. nature. The I would inertia. be, yes. And just this like constant, like, I don't know. Yes, we're engaged, but we don't have a date and I don't know. And then I think if this is something that a, the man that I look up to is telling me could work and B, it will solve my friend's problem, my best friend's problem. That would be my reasoning why she would do it. That and she's maybe trying to be more helpful. Yeah. That she's trying to be more helpful. And also it's fascinating. Well, I think what it's all really a vehicle to get to do what I really wanted to do with this book which is to essentially give a more literary or sort of philosophical treatment to the romantic comedy, you know? So basically she does this so that they can, yeah, so they can have debates about free will and debates about closure. And like my big thing with this is that I feel like I'm told, I don't know if you were told this, everyone seems to somehow be told that like when you meet the perfect person, everyone you have dated before then, them kind of, fades into the background and I think emotionally that's true Mm -hmm. um or should be but the idea that you're supposed to like forget them or being disparaging of them Mm -hmm. I feel like is a sort of discredit to your own life like I feel like there's a way that this is like (laughs) you write about being (laughs) when one of the exes that Lola runs into talks about like no it was great because without you I wouldn't have met my wife and I wouldn't have moved and I wouldn't have my twins and you write like that what am I just like a human sand pit like (laughs) that like you had to like hurdle me to get and I think he's a hurdler too he's a a, a long jumper yes so um so (laughs) that you know what are we just just yeah. like this human sand pit that someone has to like jump over to get what they want. Right, because I feel like if this book was about, let's say, a novel about um, someone's divorce or someone's marriage, I don't think anything anyone would blink, but there's something almost shameful about these like five-month relationships. I don't think it is, but I feel like it's like just enough time to do real damage to someone else <laughs> or have them do damage to you, yes. but not be able to like really claim any credit for it. Right. Like not really like, yes, you can't really mope about it for that long, but then what do you do with all that time? Does, do you not have like, it's almost like the New York thing too. It's like, people are like, Oh, it's a very New York book. And I'm like, yeah, but this is also my home. I don't have another one. So I'm just writing about my home. Right. Like this is what fills up that category. And this for her is what fills up that, the the romance the romantic category i mean the short relation i mean it's interesting because you because lola rent you no it's okay it's literally there's so much i mean (laughs) she's she's basically i took things that i've experienced and just took the dial and like broke it (laughs) turned it up as high as i could so she's definitely not me dear god but like i live in the world so yeah yeah Yes, and you read the book, but um, yeah. Yeah. but you know, I, I think what what was interesting was the the I was expecting um, when I was reading about these relationships that she keeps running into these men and and that the relationships were often kind of short, and I was like, oh wow, these people really had these men really had an impact on her, and then one of the relationships is like real short, but it's interesting. You know, the balcony. Oh yeah, that's short. It's <laughs> a really short the relationship. Balcony. It's a sexy um, book. <laughs> <laughs> but the, um, I'm trying not to give away too much, everybody. Um, so so one is very short-run relationship, but it's interesting how in our minds it doesn't really matter the length of the relationship. It doesn't always matter. Is it a five-year relationship or a one evening or just an infatuation? Like what brings the men back is what you felt towards them and how important they were 
you, Lola, sorry, what Lola thinks Anyone. about, you, you yes, is one, the group. Everyone um, here. <laughs> you know, we carry around, like what we carry around about someone maybe isn't like relative to the amount of time we spent with them. Oh, yeah. I feel like that's true for everyone. I mean, have you yeah. ever read the book Evening? No, Season I've never minor. heard of it. It's really good. Okay. <laughs> it's, it's, <laughs> um, I'll add it to my We're going to stop it. We'll okay. just read it now. Um, but, uh, I'd like to read But it's literally a woman of... who cannot get over um, this sort of incident at a wedding like years and years prior yeah. and this sort of like short romance she had and like almost on her deathbed is thinking about it. And so... It's my greatest fear. In some ways, it is. Yeah, of course, to be at a wedding is, is my greatest fear <laughs> as well. Um, <laughs> but like... But yeah, it's just like this... It's. I think the men sort of run the gamut. I think the the there's one she runs into that she knew when she was 13 or 14, and there's one that she you know is the the last serious boyfriend before her her current fiance. Um, but I guess I just I did want to sort of explore without sounding too pretentious or, or vague about it, like how memory works, how that stuff works, um, and have a a way to talk about romance that wasn't neat. That mm -hmm. wasn't a very neat ending. Um, I mean, there's a big twist to the end, um, but also about um, sort of perception because part of the deal of how this like mysterious cult works is that these men need to be influenced through a combination of <laughs> meditation and social media manipulation and um, part of the people in this. Um, again, when I say cults, I should clarify that it's like for comedic purposes. So if you're like interested in Nexium, like, <laughs> not the book for you. <laughs> like, it's not that kind yeah, of Yeah, just book. sort of the language. Yeah, I'm like, oh, don't. Um, but it's like um, all these men are being drawn to her because they are able to be reminded of her. Mm -hmm. And I think sometimes all you need to know is that you counted for someone else too. That you would... Yeah, that, that you just yeah. register for someone else. And that's, and just, it doesn't need to be like this whole like Richard Linkletter thing every single night. It's just that right. that you just know that like this was not nothing for someone else and right. that can give you sort of the closure that you need. It registers for them. Yeah. I mean, I should say... Um, it's great being an actress, by the way, because yeah. I know that all of my exes will at some yes. point have to see my face. So... It's so... It's, well, is that why you did it? <laughs> that's totally the only reason. Uh, what a joy. That actually <laughs> but, sounds great. Yeah, we need to get you a bit... <laughs> let's get, like, get Judy a billboard <laughs> in whatever neighborhood is relevant. <laughs> They're everywhere. <laughs> Um, but I, <laughs> it is, did you say they're everywhere? Yes. <laughs> um, they, <laughs> it could be anywhere. <laughs> it could be anywhere. Um, I think that was moving to me about the book was that like the need to sort of know like who she runs into and there's, and there's moments when she's like, you know, she's waiting and she's hoping like, who's it going to be? Who's it going to be? And to know that the people that pop up, the men that pop up for her also do think of her and they all, she did like register for them. And I think that that is, you know, when you talk about closure and I think so much of this book is about closure um, or thinking that we need it or defining it or trying to figure out like, what that is so that we can move on with our lives or whatever that decision is that we're putting off, you know, closure can come in many forms. And I think, you know, to see that for her, I th thought that was really beautiful. Um, well, there's a, there's a, not to quote my own book, um, but there's a line at some point. You're supposed to. <laughs> Are you supposed to? Oh, should I do it? No, yeah, I don't. You do it. We'll ask them to do it. Um, <laughs> But where she says that, you know, I think if closure is to be found, it's letting the door swing open and not slamming it, you know, because I think it's, a, it's so much pressure to just sort of forget the past. And I have to learn something from this relationship and this relationship. And it's like, I don't know, maybe that was just a mess. And also, I don't I should clarify it maybe at this juncture in the event that I am not Esther Burrell. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I don't actually like you should not take dating advice from novelists if you can avoid it at all costs, <laughs> um, especially not from people who write mostly narrative nonfiction, <laughs> um, they'll, they'll get you. Um, but no, but there is a way that I just, um, I could fit in all these themes, yeah, to fiction, like like the closure, like that stuff, and, and write about romance in a way that I, I just, I got really excited to do it because, well, I guess for two reasons. One is that I had been avoiding it for a really long time. You know, you know how it is. Where you get totally. <laughs> no, but you get like I mean, who more than an an actress gets pigeonholed? 
you know, you do a couple of parts and then you're, you know, and it's like writers have the same thing. It's not as bad, I don't think, but it's like to be a woman who writes mostly narrative nonfiction and start writing about, you know, ha 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 dating is really dangerous from a sort of perception point of view and a career point of view. And uh, yeah, finally, I, mean, I don't, I was I don't like, know about that. That's so interesting. Is it so, <laughs> it's, well, it's, it's, it feels like, because you get, it's the chiclet thing or, or whatever, Yes, you know, and I feel like I finally was like, at a certain point, if people are going to think I'm writing about this stuff anyway, screw it. I mean, I care about it. It takes a tremendous amount of my life. I'm not writing, you know, people write for different reasons. People write for political reasons or whatever. And I'm like, I, I'm writing to entertain. And so all these topics and this idea of closure and stuff like that, that I sort of felt uncomfortable and squeamish about writing and nonfiction, you can hide a ton sometimes not so subtly, <laughs> in fiction. <laughs> like, um, I was going to ask about, when you're talking about like a, 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 well, I don't know what, you, like a comedic book, okay. um, like a funny novel, and yeah. and just segueing a little bit into, um, this is something that I've been annoyed with in Hollywood, is why I feel like, um, like comedies don't get the love that Ugh. they deserve. I guess Diane Keaton never won an Oscar. No, she must have. These are the questions I ask myself. You guys must know. Could Google that? It would be. Yeah, she would have. Do you think she she won for for any all? I've never heard of that movie. I did. Um, (laughs) (laughs) Like I said, Diane Keaton has (laughs) never won an Oscar. Uh, um, Oh God! But go ahead. Well, I just, you know, you and I were emailing a little bit about it, and I thought it was an interesting topic um, about, and and so when you're talking about like being nervous to be like a female author and like writing fiction and like chiclet and and what I think of as like beach reads, you know, like yeah. like why is it that books that are um, that are sort of like funny? When I was Googling like um, comic novels, it was all about graphic novels, which is not what we're talking about. But I know like fun home. I don't know. I, oh yeah. I can't read pictures. Um, so <laughs> <laughs> I've never been good at it. But um, the uh, but there but but that is something. And then it took me to an article about bridesmaids, which I guess is the only comedy that's ever been made because that's what people want to talk about. And they're like, why wasn't a movie like Bridesmaids? Nominated. Why aren't more novels that are funny and romantic and lighter, let's say, like why aren't they recognized as much when you think of awards? You know, I I was thinking about um, and as Andrew Sean Greer mm. writes um, about your book in your book, but uh, less like. I feel like tonally this very much reminds me of Less, which oh won the Thank Pulitzer, you. by the way, and I wonder what you think about that. I love less. No, I'm kidding. I know that's not what you're asking. No, yeah. I mean, less is amazing. And, but like, but I feel like this is tonally in that same world, in that same kind of genre, like a, like a coming of age story about someone who's not young. I think that, Although 37 is pretty young. 37 is pretty young. Weirdly, she's, um, well, I'm going to answer your question and I won't forget it, but very quickly, I will say, <laughs> oh, I'm going to do it. <laughs> I don't mean I to so threaten you in front of everyone, but I will answer that. the question. Okay. But no, very quickly, I will say that um, there's some, for some fact checking reason, because of like uh, a reference that's made in the book and when she would have been in New York. Um, she's 38 in the finished book and 37 in the galley of the book. And so I'm like, she's, she's grown a lot. Than... She's like literally she's grown, grown, grown up. up. She's grown up. Oh, she's well, all grown well. up. But um, no, I think I will answer with um, a friend the other day had, um, well, still has a teenage daughter. Had her the other day, still has the daughter. She's not a year older. She's still not a year older. Um, and uh, he was mad at her about something. And she's like, it sounds like you're having a personal problem, which I thought was a hilarious, like cheeky thing for a teenager to say. Um, I was like, I don't know if she's going to be brilliant or a real problem. But either way, I I listened to this question about why things are not taken or comedies are not taken seriously. And I can't help but hear this kid's voice looking at the people who are making these decisions about what gets awarded or what gets like review coverage, all that stuff. And I feel like it sounds like they're having a personal problem. Like, I feel like they I am having a personal problem. But but like almost like they're self-conscious it seems like it's nothing like the effort. It seems effortless the way that researching, you know, the, the Amos, the character I read a little bit about, 
um, the has first the ex first that the first she runs ex into. is a novelist who's not a very successful novelist until he writes a novel um, that is about an Israeli like child who crawls um, to Palestine uh, Palestine Palestine um, through like a Hamas built tunnel and emerges in a land where there's no such thing as war and it's on the bestseller list. Because I'm just like and that's the kind of, but that's obviously it. me satirizing. Of course, that, that that people would take that so seriously, you know. And I feel like I don't. Um, it's it's weird because I think people think everyone has the capacity to be funny, and that not everyone has the capacity to write about Syria. And I think both things are true. Like I always have relatives, and I don't know if you have relatives that do things like this to you, but where they're like. Why didn't you just write like John Grisham? And I'm like, well, oh that's... my god, why am I not in a Hallmark movie? Why are you? Why aren't you? Um, <laughs> can you speak to well, that? I haven't asked. <laughs> I haven't asked. <laughs> that I know. Of. I know. Well, actually, I know you're joking, but literally, part that haven't asked thing. A little part of me is like, this is disrespectful to John Grisham and myself, equally. <laughs> like, it's just disrespectful. Like, what he? I can't do what he does. That's why. And I don't want to. And he doesn't want to do what I do. So it's like this idea that comedy, though, is sort of in us all, and therefore it's like closer to the surface and it's just happened to be like something that you mind and not that it's difficult. Mm -hmm. I don't know. There's something, there's something about it that I, I think people's what... own self-consciousness about how they receive things. Yeah. I thought that I wondered what it would, what a writer would say about that. Like I know what. Yeah. Well, other... I don't know what, I mean, why do you think, I mean, I think it's getting slightly better. It is. In I, terms of what yes. ends up winning like best picture. Maybe post-pandemic, it'll be slightly better, too. Yes. We'll have to get through all those pandemic films first. But then <laughs> once those win the awards, yeah. then we'll maybe get yeah. some comedies. A little bit. There. I mean, it's 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 funny because this book you know, is a comedy. Um, like I said, not if you're looking for a book on cults. <laughs> um, this is not your friend. Um, but it it is really like not... It's before it was written before the pandemic, so mm -hmm. I just don't have this like I don't know. It's it was nice to edit during the pandemic and and cheer myself up when I was yeah. in my tiny apartment. <laughs> it was um, it's so funny, and Thank I feel you. like a, a loser that I want to look at my look at your <clears> questions. my questions because I have so many good ones, and that says the word pandemic, so I'm not asking that one. Um, <laughs> why <laughs> covered <laughs> um, <laughs> Purell. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I wonder about, um, I wonder about, so Lola, she has the choice to not engage in this mm. grand experiment and she does. Um, and so we've already talked about closure, but right. do you feel like if you were given this opportunity, would I do it? Would you do it? When I do would it? you want to see them all <laughs> on the street? So Okay, so like you know, I was, um, you know, like before. <laughs> Sorry, I just forgot we had an audience. <laughs> um, I was talking about how you know the sort of impetus for the book, and um, it's a little bit about the avoiding of romance. It's a little bit inspired by this physical building of this this shul on the Lower yeah. East Side. Is and that a real place? I mean, it's it kind of. Have you? Were you like, ooh? Yeah, I tried to contact the guy who owns it to take a tour and he was not having it no 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 mm. he's not interested although I ran into him outside and gave him a galley of the book like a <gasps> total nut and like a true New Yorker he's like I'll read it and I'll see if I like it oh and my then gosh I can, if and I then like maybe it, you can get you're like I wrote a book a about this yeah, place yeah I wrote a book about this place he's like I don't know if I like it I'm like oh my God, I, I love him love you <laughs> um <laughs> why do we like to be treated so I know <laughs> Well, because it's the Groucho Marxism thing, right? You're like, I, I just want in. <laughs> just kidding. Yeah. I don't know what that is. I've never seen a picture. But no, um, the, but the would I do it? Would I actually yeah. do this? I think a lot of the book comes from essentially what this book is, and it's not very selling because it's going to sound like a nightmare, is if you went through the text messages that you're not supposed to look at from yes. past relationships that are still lingering in your phone and suddenly these things that were supposed to be memories have yes. morphed into emotions and that is very dangerous. Yes. And so this is like a manifestation of that. So that would, would be a point towards not doing it. I think I would be so curious. I know. To see, I was like, really? So if I step 
within a five block radius of this mm-hmm. place, I'll run into like a random ex-boyfriend. And, you know, before both of our times, um, there was a game show called This Is Your Life. Oh, I know that. I it mean, was a while I mean, ago. Yeah, I mean, like, I don't remember. Yeah, it, you but can't like, possibly. No. Yeah. I watched the Phil Collins one once. Okay, yeah. Anyway. But anyway, but it, it's a game show. But And this is that. You yes. know, and so why wouldn't you go into this the game show? Your, those, all, all those people went. This is the, your love life. This is your love this life. This is also a limited series television show <laughs> that we will be selling later on. Yeah. This is There's your love life. There's lots of material to option here. <laughs> Nobody leaves. Lock them in. Lock them in. <laughs> you all have to sign something before you go. Sorry. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think that. The bags. <laughs> <laughs> um, I didn't think about that, but that is so true. This is your love life. That is kind of. I. I, I also um, wanted to ask about a real television show and. Uh, for some reason, I'm like embarrassed to ask this question, but I have to because I was thinking a little bit about, um, and I'm not a New Yorker, so I don't know, maybe New Yorkers hate sex in the city, but... I like the question mark. Like, it's yeah. like, I went to school in Cambridge? Well, yes. Um, <laughs> in Boston? Um, I felt sometimes when I was reading this, this was like opposite sex in the city. Like, our Lola gets her big, but mm. then she has to go backwards in time to see all the things, like all the men that yeah. led her there. I don't oh, know wow. if that resonates at all or no, offends you correct. greatly. I'm sorry if it does. No, no, no. I love it that seems, show. It seems very correct, actually. Okay. Um, on a side note, I live around the corner from you the do. Sex and the City facade, so there's constantly people taking yes. pictures. You can do a whole tour. I haven't done it, but you can like do a se- Well, you probably you, know because you I, see it. I live. You live in the I tour. I live the tour oh. every day. <laughs> That's exciting. No, and it's not. No, it's not. The cupcakes are really dry. But um, <laughs> the, 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 <laughs> I used to live on the street that went up to the Hollywood sign, and I was dodging tourists until yeah, I eventually had to move because I knew I was going to run someone over. Oh, yeah. See, that's it. Yeah, it was like that's, really dangerous, yeah. um, Hats, actually. Sunglasses. Yeah, it is actually. Yeah, it was. I was nervous I was going to kill somebody. Um, I, uh, but yeah, I, it does that. That's a really good. That's a really good way to put it. I mean, mostly I would say the cinematic, or I mean, there is a Dickensian sort of idea of it, where it's like you know you will be visited by three ghosts, yes, kind the of thing. Christmas Carol yeah. meets The Exorcist. Christmas Carol write. meets The Exorcist. Somebody <laughs> describes it as the book. Um, but also, it's like this is not you know as much as I I don't want to dismantle the idea of my book is a original work but like it's um you know there's it shades is. of eternal sunshine shades of her shades of groundhog day mm-hmm. even like palm springs these books but what's yeah. funny is these are all always um applied to men all of yeah. us are men. it's a wonderful life man <gasps> man 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 and it's like very rare with the exception i think of like russian doll where like a yes. woman needs to go through something again and again and figure out her shit yeah, you know. and why? Uh, why do? Why do we need to go through it so many times? What's wrong with us? Well, what's wrong with them? I mean, <laughs> I know that's true. That's well, true. Well, because you don't. It's, you know everything. I always feel like you know everything. You're told all the platitudes as a kid, right? You can't judge a book by its cover, or like live by the golden rule, and then it takes you like another eighty years right. to learn what you knew in second grade. <laughs> Right. <laughs> there is a little book that you can buy at the checkout counter about like what I learned in kindergarten. Oh, really? Yeah. It also, was, don't option that. Yeah. Because <laughs> definitely. People are vipers. Yeah, I know. <laughs> this group, I could feel it. I know. <laughs> um, <laughs> vultures. Vultures and vipers. <laughs> yeah. But it's true. I mean, we do get told this and we just have to really have it hit over yeah. our heads, don't we? Yeah. How much do you think you would pay for closure? <laughs> <laughs> so these, can you put a price can on Can you put a price on it? I mean, <laughs> so, you know, in the book, Clive, our ringleader, he has arra- he's uh, organized a group of people to do this, um, to meditate, to influence social media so these men keep coming back. So these are going to be packages that people in the future of this novel and the world of this novel can purchase. Mm -hmm. And I wonder, like, do you think people would pay for it? Pay to, you know, (laughs) I always joke about wanting to spring clean my brain. Like I wish I could pull everything out of my brain. Recondo your head. Yes. (laughs) And I don't know why I can't just be hypnotized to forget things or just be happy all the time. But anyway, I wonder like, would you don't really want that? Yes, I do. <laughs> I'm gonna be happy all the time. 
I mean, judging by that laugh, maybe you do. You're like, <laughs> <laughs> don't we all just want to be happy? Um, we wouldn't have any art if we were all happy. No, so see, I'm glad exactly, that we're all unhappy. Exactly. You have to have um, the range. But would I pay to do I mean, it? do you feel like, let's say, like this could be a pilot program? I mean, or like, are we, I mean, I know we are getting subtly manipulated at all times by our phones. Yes. Um, but do you feel like in the real world, do you think people would buy this? Um, well, two things. One is in the book, it costs like the minimum for this sort of almost actually another cinematic comp. I should start reading some books, but, um, <laughs> um, you know, for like this Truman show esque mm -hmm. thing where everything has to be sort of, um, focused on this one person. Um, it costs like $250,000 minimum. But people are flying to space. I know. I, that's true. Um, but, <laughs> but also, I feel like if I had like a hundred dollars in real life, I could do it. I need a hundred dollars and the password to your Instagram account, and done. And you could just I can do it make for me. A ton of things happen, and it's just like. Um, but I think that it could happen. I think I would. I don't know if I would do it. I don't think I would do it, but I think it's really close to happening you know i don't I mean think it's it is that. in a way i was I, I had some words about cults and social media being yeah. a type of cult and, well, and a lot of it is a send-up of technology social media yes. wellness culture which yes. is you know i'm sure no one here knows anything about no that. we don't like wellness in los angeles no. we're not icky, into icky. it at all um <laughs> i do have to uh allow you all to ask your own oh, questions yes. now um if you'd like to do that yes. But you I You cannot say, option yes. any of this. No, yes. you can't have any of these <laughs> ideas up here. Um, so ideas factory. <laughs> <laughs> Does anyone want to be the first person to ask a question? We'll be coming around with the microphone and just make sure to keep your mask on when you ask your question. We will also sit here for as long yes. as it takes. I'll keep, I will keep talking. Yeah. You're stuck in this room for like 15 more minutes, yeah. so it's either us or you. It's really fun to just the, the amount of like vague threats we've thrown at these, <laughs> these lovely people who showed up tonight. Thank and I'm like, you you're going to sit out, here, by the way. give yourself a <laughs> very Oh, oh. man. <laughs> we shouldn't have worn floral prints. I knew it. I know it. Next, <laughs> I told I told you. I told you. <laughs> we coordinated. Uh, um, okay, no, we'll stop talking. So, okay. Yeah, I'm gonna use this opportunity to just look down at my. Oh, I'll say yeah. a funny thing. I'm gonna, I'm gonna drink this. Drink it. Great. Um, a funny thing. Oh, mm. a great. We have we have, we a, have a question. We're coming. We're coming. Oh no! Wait. Oh. You have, have to have the microphone. Shh. I think she said she wants to buy everyone here this book. <laughs> <laughs> Did I hear it wrong? <laughs> Thank a, you. <laughs> it's a very simple question, but I was wondering what inspired you to write this book. It's a good question. <laughs> Seems like one I should have asked. It's, uh, <laughs> no. This and happens yet. to me every every time I interview someone. They're like, "Hi, yes, I'm just I didn't catch your name." I'm like, "Shit, <laughs> sorry." <laughs> um. <sighs> I think I just really wanted to, um, yeah, so sort of apply a kind of just an opportunity to put everything I wanted in a book without it feeling too crowded. So that's sort of more of a craft answer to your question because I think I already basically was like, yes, I wanted to write about romance in this intelligent way. And yes, I wanted to um, write about sort of older friendships. Um, but like there's basically... <laughs> There's an author named Jim Crace. Do you know who that is? Or does anyone know who that is? Jim Crace is an amazing British author. He's written, written like nine books, and he had the great misfortune of retiring the day Philip Roth retired, so no one gives a shit. Um, it's like how Farrah Fawcett died when Michael Jackson died. It's not. Oh, that's right. Yeah. Also, See? David Hasselhoff had a pay-per-view fight on the day that O.J. Simpson was chased in his white Bronco, so nobody paid to watch. <laughs> no, it was a concert. It was a David that Hasselhoff. That is such a better example than the Farrah Fawcett. No, I think it's actually, because I'm it's then dark. I'm doubling down it's on dark. how no one cares about Farrah Fawcett by not... Yeah, talking. you are actually so. doubling down. And Jim Crace. But, but, so okay. Jim Crace, but he um, used to say um, that is, I, and this is not a great boon for the arts as in general as a concept, but it is helpful in terms of motivating me on a sort of uh, micro level, he used to say that never forget that you are a volunteer. 
That is your job. That is your job to entertain people. No one actually really needs you. Again, not a great thing when you're thinking about the arts in general, but as a specific writer we'll in happy. your room, you're like, oh my gosh, what? It's so dark. Um, but uh, that I feel like that if I could somehow tell the story I wanted to tell and make it entertaining and fresh, and I don't know if I've succeeded, but I know what I wanted to do, which is tackle a subject that is extremely well-trodden. Like there are certain things that I think you have to have like a fair amount of balls to tackle and love and dating in New York, I think might be one of them. Also the civil war. <laughs> Just cause it's so like, you know, and I feel like I, when I finally felt that I had this, structure both with the friendships that we've talked about and with this like wackadoo kind of like goop on speed cult-like thing in this building which was so fun to describe I mean to just like there's a crystallarium in it where there's just like a big room with an amethyst geode where people just like get vibes it was so fun um I so that's it. So it's the entertaining those. thing so basically it was like how to make something that is a bit of a cliche new and entertaining and that's what I wanted you did it. Yeah. Thanks. <laughs> Thanks, Judy. <laughs> you have to say that. No, I, I don't, but... Oh, there's another... Oh, Ooh. this is great. This is good. We thought we were going to yeah. have to really harass you. I know. Um, <laughs> you had talked about um, how comedy wasn't getting the props it should get or whatever, and I just had this thought in my head that it seems like more and more... Th I mean, it's called dramedy mm -hmm. in, 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 in business, I guess, but... It seems like that wasn't so much a thing. The further back you go, it was more like Dostoevsky or, you know, something just, you know, funny, all, all funny all the time. And then over time, they, they're getting crammed more and more into the same. You very seldom see something where nobody's funny anymore. Right. They always have something because it's Lambert. unrealistic to have Dostoevsky, you know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so don't you think that that's one of the reasons why comedy doesn't get... Because in reality, in the past, mm -hmm. it was true. And now it's like, well, it's really all one. So you're saying basically like when a drama is... Like, it's like succession, right? Like that's comedy. You know what I mean? It's like a like what it, when something is awarded and given these high accolades, it's like the comedy is like swept in with it maybe. Right. So, I, am I, I don't know if right. I'm misinterpreting. And like, yeah, I mean, and, and if something is just pure comedy all the time, but I, do I don't know. It, it, it just seems like that is, that is becoming rare and, and isn't, isn't, well, certainly things I think that are are all comedy are that all the time don't get recognized as like art in a way right. that something that has like more layers to it would. Well, that's, that's what and I'm saying. I think I guess I'm thinking about I was doing research on on novels because I was curious about like the novels that seem to get you know the top ten best books of the year from the New York Times or something like. I don't feel like they're often laugh riots. Laugh riots. But also, like, but it's not. But like, I mean, Chekhov is very funny. Lolita is hilarious. <laughs> I mean, it's a buddy road trip buddy comedy for the ages. Um, but no, gen <laughs> genuinely, sorry, that's dark. But it is. It is. It is like. It's, but like, that's all the time we have. Thank <laughs> you. <laughs> <laughs> You're like Sloan. Not again. Not again. She loves Lolita. She's <laughs> gonna get canceled. <laughs> This is being recorded. Um, People are watching this at home. I know. It's great. It's wonderful. <laughs> I hope. But no, but it, I know what you mean, where you feel like it was like, but I do feel like it's always been um, combined. And the best comedy also has some sort of heartfelt elements to it. I just think that if something is just, it's, if, it's, if it's a comedy forward foot, if it's not this natural mixture, I do think people think um, it's just too amorphous of a skill. You know, or wit doesn't get a lot of play in a weird way. Like socially it does, but like to be a great wit. Like Dorothy Parker tried to write a novel her entire life and she never could. And, um, you know, she also tried to swallow a bottle of shoe polish. So that could, wasn't good Did either. she do that? She did. But she didn't, you know, she's fine. I'm not. She yeah. died of, I mean, she's not fine, fine. She's dead. But she, <laughs> she's fine. 
Is that what call, is that what's huffing? Is that huffing? No, I think oh, that's, that's a predates huffing. Okay, that'd be amazing. The original huffing. You're like as you know, Joseph Mitchell used to do whippets like nonstop. Like <laughs> Dorothy Parker, the original <laughs> huffer. <laughs> oh my God, that's fun. That would be a fun game. Also, for optioning it. For optioning um, <laughs> to assign, dr- assign, assign modern day drugs to like dead authors. No one. No, this is our show. <laughs> sorry. Okay. It could also be a board game. Yes. Yes. Oh, sorry. The over there. Oh, that's so good. Uh, I was wondering if you could talk about the difference between writing fiction and your uh, more journalistic work. Sure. Um, one is fake. No. <laughs> no. I mean, I think that uh, it's just a very. It's a. It's very strange. I always feel like it's like describing it's like a very different muscle everything inside is different and that but the skin is the same just to be really sort of gnarly about it um so that basically like there are only so many ways to say I picked up this mug and you know it's going to look the same in fiction it's going to look the same in nonfiction. you know because it's just sort of how I would describe something but for both narrative nonfiction and for journalism it's just I get to operate and bounce off the world, um, which is its own challenge. And then all you want to do is just make stuff up. And then it's like, great, wonderful. Speaking of wish fulfillment, I did this. I you know, made it up. And then it's just a real pain in the ass because everything is your responsibility. <laughs> um, so it's, it's, I sort of toggle back and forth between the two. But I do think that there is a sort of a slightly disingenuous thing that writers tend to say about, like, you know, Oh no no it's totally different you know it's and this is completely made up or something else is you know completely truthful um, but we're also very mixed up about these things I mean I think you know what is correct and what's not when you're sort of writing like I don't know this is maybe a little bit off topic but I will say that I always find it very interesting that if I were to give you um, a novel and compliment it I would say this is so realistic. <laughs> Like, it's just so, she really captured this. He really captured that. And if I were to give you a memoir and recommend it, I'd be like, it's unbelievable. <laughs> like, <laughs> and this is how, like, we, we swap out, like, the sort of accolades for, for the different forms in a, re- in a really weird way. Um, but, <laughs> yeah, I don't know. That's a long-winded answer. But I guess I just, I don't... Um, it's it's nice to work on both at the same time because it's just very different muscles. Um, but then sometimes if there's just something I've observed, like, oh, you know, wow, that something looks like something else, a simile, an analogy, it gets jotted down and funneled into whoever needs it first, like a blood transfusion. <laughs> That's, uh, we, so, oh, sorry, did someone else? Oh, I was just making sure we have time for one more Oh, we have time question. for one more because well, I answered, be my like, question. <laughs> No, yes, we, can do, we can do your question and then one more question. Okay, but make it something we can option. <laughs> Whoever answers. Well, I was, uh, I forgot my question, so. Oh, no. No, it's okay. It's my brain. <laughs> well, one more from the, one more from you guys. We'll calm down and so you can answer a question. Or ask a question. It's going to be a good one. Yeah, it's going to be good. Oh, there we go. Hello. I wonder if any of the characters are inspired by real characters. Ah, oh, there we go. <laughs> <laughs> um, no. And I mean, the short answer really is no. I will say that there are two that I can think of that share like a pretty distinct exoskeleton with some real people. But it's after a while, it's like a shell game. Um, you know, where there are certain characters. Like, if I were one of my ex-boyfriends reading this and thought something was about me, I'd be like, you know, the joke about different countries. It's like, oh, don't like the what? You know, you don't like the weather. Like, wait a minute, or you know, it's like, then wait another couple paragraphs. You might see yourself somewhere else as well, because it's basically like the gestalt of an entire experience plus a bunch of made-up stuff. So it's like a shell game where they truly are not. I think there there are two, yeah there are two that I like know from their professions, but otherwise that I would have myself a tremendous amount of difficulty genuinely being like that's that person. Um, so I have very best of luck to anyone who can do it for me, <laughs> since I can't. But um, you know, they're definitely inspired by 
experiences that I've had, stories I've, you know, been told. I haven't done a tremendous amount of online dating, and yet there's like a, a sort of monologue in the middle on it because I live in the world, and you know, stuff sort of comes in through osmosis. Um, but there are, yeah, there, are, there. Are, it would, I would be lying if I said there weren't like a couple that I'm like, I know how you started. Um, but then the second you give them a fake name, it's it's over, you know. Yeah. Oh, one more. Oh, is that we're done? We're done. No more. No more. That's it. I'm sorry. No more. No. Thank you for doing this. I thank you for asking <laughs> thank you. me to. Thank you all so much for coming. Thank you so much for coming. Books are for sale, but none of the ones that we made up tonight. <laughs> <laughs> thank, thank you. you. Thank you. <laughs> thank you all, and thank you guys. That was. I mean, it was so nice to laugh. Thank you. And um, Sloan will be signing in the lobby uh, right after this. And come next week, Thursday at 7.30, Tom Parada will be here with us. Thank you.